Well, our treatment of heat engines and refrigerators would, of course, not be complete without a good look at the Carnot cycle. So that's not Carnot, Carnot. And just like every other PV cycle that we've looked at, it consists uh, completely of simple processes for which we have uh, formulas that we can use to analyze the heat and work and change in energy. And for this particular cycle, we're looking at two isotherms. We've got an isotherm on top and bottom, and then two adiabats on the side. That's it. And you can see already that the, the area enclosed, it's, it's kind of a, a little sliver. You could take this same arc length here and enclose a much larger area, like a rectangle or even a circle. And that would correspond to a greater output work for that different cycle. But we are going to show that this sliver shape actually corresponds to the greatest efficiency. It's the highest theoretical or theoretically possible efficiency for a heat engine. Now, while the Carnot cycle is not the only reversible cycle, it's the quintessential reversible heat engine. So in order to discuss reversibility, let's review some vocabulary. This, this stuff is pretty basic. I just pulled this off the web. We know that the state of an ideal gas is really just a specification of its location on the PV diagram. Because for a fixed number of moles, if you know P and V, then you also know T. And that means that you know uh, everything there is to know about the gas. Like for instance, you could also calculate the total energy. And it's assumed that a state corresponds to um, an equilibrium configuration of the gas. They can't, the gas cannot be in the process of rapidly expanding or having a heat transfer. It's like it's already settled on its, its final values of pressure, volume, et cetera. And when we take a, a traje trajectory along the PV diagram, it's understood that we're passing continuously through an infinite number of states, equilibrium states. And of course, that's, that's never true in real life. Like inside your car engine, you're not really taking the gas through a series of equilibrium states because while gas is exploding, you can't possibly be at equilibrium. But for many purposes, the cycle that the fuel air mixture goes through within the cylinder of an internal combustion engine is close enough to a sequence of equilibrium states. And they call that a, a quasi static process. Just think of everything happening really slowly so that there's time for the gas to adjust to its new equilibrium state before having to move on to the next one. So as I mentioned, here's an example of something that's not really quasi-static. You can model it as such for calculating basic results like efficiency. But while this gas is rapidly expanding with the introduction of heat like that, it can't possibly be moving continuously through equilibrium states. Okay, here's an, a classic example of a non-reversible process. That's supposed to be an E on the end. Correction, that should be no letter on the end. So here we go. Classic example of a non-reversible process. Suppose you have a, a quantity of gas constrained so that it occupies only half of this volume here, and then the barrier or the partition in the middle of that box is suddenly removed, and the gas is allowed to rapidly expand and fill the entire chamber. That will never happen in reverse, at least not spontaneously. Those particles will never regroup themselves on the other side. And this is an example that shows up in a discussion of entropy. Um, in going from here to here, I think you've actually doubled the entropy. There's a way of calculating that. And we know that the, one of the statements of the second law of thermodynamic dynamics says that uh, no spontaneous process will ever involve a decrease in entropy. So we would never go from here back to here. Now, if you had um, very slowly moved this partition to the right, so very gradually moved it to the right and allowed the gas to occupy greater and greater volumes, you could then do that in reverse. And that could be considered a reversible process, but it would have to be extremely slow. It's the fact that you just removed this thing all at once and allowed the gas to expand and fill the volume that makes it non reversible. And if you're not sure you understand the distinction, well, it's a, it's a subtle idea, and I really think that you would need to look at it mathematically using the definition of entropy to really distinguish between the two. Okay, now suppose we, we'd like to take a quantity of gas from a lower temperature, temperature to a higher temperature. So here's a set of isotherms, and this arrow is cutting across isotherms in the direction of higher temperature. 
And let's say we'd like to take a gas along an isobaric process, that's constant pressure from here to here. And you'll note that I chose a pressure around 100 kilopascals or atmospheric pressure, and we're going to allow the, the volume to expand. And that means we're gonna go from roughly this isotherm here to this isotherm here. We're going to begin and then end at a higher temperature. And in order to help you visualize that, uh, here's a, a quantity of gas, and let's pretend that this piston is massless so that the, the uh, gas in here really only has to match the pressure of the atmosphere above. If this thing had mass, like the piston had mass, then the pressure in here would have to be a little bit greater than atmospheric pressure so that it was supporting the atmosphere and the additional weight of the piston. So piston's massless, and that means that the pressure inside the cylinder is simply equal to the atmospheric pressure above. And let's say that you've got this cylinder on what I'll call a temperature reservoir. So who cares about the details? This box is, is uh, maintained at some specific temperature. We don't need to know the details of how that's accomplished, but it's always at the temperature that you set, and it's got such a large quantity of mass within it that it has a lot of thermal inertia, so you really can't change its temperature. Like, think of this as like the ocean. If you drop a hot piece of copper into the ocean, you're not going to raise the ocean's temperature, even though heat will flow from the copper into the ocean. It's impossible to raise the temperature of the ocean. So suppose we start out with the reservoir and the cylinder at the same temperature. And uh, because they're at the same temperature, there's, there's nothing about the second law of thermodynamics, or I should say the second law of thermodynamics does not prohibit the spontaneous transfer of some infinitesimal quantity of heat from one side to the other. Remember, the second law says that heat always flows from, or uh, I was gonna say it flows from hot to cold, but really what it says is that it won't flow from cold to hot. Well, that's not being violated here because these are at the same temperature. And remember, the transfer of heat, that's because of the thermal interaction between the particles in the cylinder and the particles in this reservoir. Think of those submicroscopic collisions between atoms and molecules. Every time they bump into each other, there's a, a random exchange of energy from one side to the other. So suppose that there is an infinitesimal transfer of heat into the cylinder. Yeah, there's a, your little graphic to remind you about the second law. Did I just switch directions? Oh, right, I'm showing you that it could go either way. Because they're at the same temperature, either one of these transfers is acceptable. And besides, it's infinitesimal. Okay, now supposing that it does go from the reservoir to the cylinder. That small quantity of gas would, not gas, that small quantity of heat would raise the temperature of the gas by some tiny amount. Now really, it would be an infinitesimal increase in temperature because I'm talking about an infinitesimal quantity of heat. Did I say that correctly? It would be an infinitesimal increase in temperature because the amount of heat that flowed is infinitesimal. Now I can't actually, pick a number that reflects something infinitesimal. So I just went with a thousandth of an increase or a thousandth of a degree increase. And then as soon as that, that heat has spontaneously transferred like that and you've raised the temperature, you whisk away the reservoir, take it away. So now this cylinder of gas is stuck at that temperature. Because really what I'm trying to do here is show you how theoretically you could take a gas through a finite temperature difference and have that still be a reversible process. Okay, now that it's back up at this temperature, you take your reservoir, which is uh, out of scene at present, and you raise its temperature to the same temperature, 80.001, and you bring the reservoir back in. So now you've got a new reservoir at this uh, temperature that matches. And so just like before, the heat transfer could go either way. The second law does not prohibit a transfer of heat in either direction. So suppose that you do wait for a, a tiny transfer of heat to the gas, which would bump its temperature up to 80.002, and then before heat can flow back, according to the second law, let's remove the reservoir again. So we've made these two infinitesimal increases in the temperature of the gas, but both of those increases were, in a sense, reversible because they involved, let me go back, they involved heat being transferred between two objects that were essentially at the same temperature. And that is not a violation of the second law. So in that sense, it could go either way, meaning it was reversible. And so you just continue that process. Um, you allow, so if you've got the reservoir at 80.0002, I've got an extra zero in there. 
darn it. I'll just let that one slide. Pretend that's O02. You've allowed the quantity DQ to move to the gas, which would bump its temperature up to 80.003. Take away the reservoir, and now we've gotten the temperature all the way up to 80.003. And you would just continue that process until you achieve whatever temperature you'd like for the final state. Okay, so theoretically, you could reverse that sequence of steps, right? You could bring in a reservoir now that's at 80.003. Okay, I don't have that slide, but bring in a reservoir at 80.003, wait for a DQ to go from the gas into the reservoir, which would bring the gas's temperature down, take away the reservoir, swap in a new reservoir that's at 80.002, and so on. I try to avoid that phrase and so on because I had an instructor years ago that, that um, really abused that expression and a lot of my classmates noticed it. And one day we kept a tally of all the and so ons. And before the hour was up, we were over a hundred. So we just kind of gave up. Okay, let's, let's analyze this now because there's a very simple formula for the efficiency of a Carnot engine. And it would be nice to see where that comes from. This is developed in your book. I guess one other point here. Here's another type of reversible process because the one I just talked about, taking the gas through a, a sequence of isotherms uh, in a reversible manner, that's really not one of the processes in the Carnot cycle. Now there is an adiabat, there are two adiabats in the, in the Carnot cycle, but that's, those are also different from the process I just described. So let's now talk about a reversible isothermal process. Here's your quantity of gas in a cylinder with a movable piston. And currently the gas is at the same temperature T as the reservoir. Reservoir, And remember, this reservoir is so vast, it's got like an infinite thermal inertia. You're not going to change the temperature of the reservoir by dumping a little bit of heat in or out. Okay, the first step would be to make a tiny little inward motion with the piston. Push it through a distance dx, which means the volume of the gas would decrease by an amount dv. And we know as a result that the temperature is going to go up. Because remember, first law of thermodynamics, if you're doing work on a gas, then unless there's an outflow of heat, the temperature is going to increase. And it takes time for heat to flow out. So I'm imagining that, that we do this little, well, I'm breaking it up into pieces because I just said that it was slow. So it's, it's not necessarily abrupt. But um, think of it this way. Like, it, it takes at least some amount of time for the heat to flow out of the gas. So when you first compress it just a little bit, the temperature goes up just slightly. And then as a result, there's an infinitesimal quantity of heat DQ that flows right back out. Now, DT is really not a finite temperature difference. The idea is that these two temperatures are still so close together, you could, you could have heat, you could almost have heat transfer in either direction. I realize that I'm using rather imprecise language here, but DT is not a finite temperature difference. It's infinitesimal. The second law prohibits an exchange of heat um, through a finite difference from cold to hot. Okay, well, since uh, DQ is flowing out, that can bring the temperature right back down to T. So we did just a tiny bit of work on the gas, which increased its temperature infinitesimally, but then that heat was shed immediately into the reservoir bringing the temperature back down to T. So these are still at the same temperature. And that's the whole point here. We're trying to keep the gas um, at constant temperature because this is an isothermal process. But the, the little process I just showed, it could have gone either way because the difference between the, or the difference between the temperatures was infinitesimal. Okay, now we repeat. Scoot this thing in just a little bit. The temperature goes up infinitesimally. We shed an infinitesimal amount of heat and now we're back down to temperature T, all right? So we're, we're doing work on the gas while it's simultaneously losing heat. So whatever goes in the front door goes right out the back door in a reversible manner. Here's the same graphic one more time. Do a little bit of work, raise the temperature, shed the heat back down to the original temperature. And again, when I say raise the temperature, I mean raise through an infinitesimal amount. Oh, one more, just in case it's not clear. Okay, for your review, here's the formula for the efficiency, the thermal efficiency, if you will, of a heat engine. It's the useful output work, that's what you get compared to what you pay for, QH, that's the heat released by burning the coal or oil, 
but we also know that workout is whatever's left over after you subtract the exhausted heat from the absorbed heat, distribute QH, here's the expression for efficiency. So if we can evaluate the, the heats, the net heats uh, to the hot and cold reservoir for this Carnot engine, then we will have our expression for the efficiency. Well, two of the processes are adiabatic and by definition, an adiabat adiabatic process involves no transfer of heat. So those two are zero. We really just have to find the heat transfers for the isotherms. Now, for an isothermal process, there's no change in energy because an ideal gas has an energy that's completely determined by the temperature. So that means, um, I, I'm also gonna make the further substitution here. This is the work done on the gas. W for your book is the work done on the gas. Let's swap that for the work, the negative of the work done by the system or by the gas. System gas, same thing here. And since delta E is zero for an isothermal process, then we know that Q has to equal the work. That's, that's for any individual process. So if we can just calculate the work integral, you know, integral of PDV from one to two, then that will equal the heat. So let me repeat that. For an isothermal process, because of the first law, the heat absorbed is equal to the work done by the gas. And the same will be true for this bottom isotherm as well. Okay, well, I'm just going to quote the result because I think you remember that for an isothermal process, the work done, it's the integral of PDV, use the ideal gas law to substitute. Instead of P, you can write NRT over V, pull out the NRT because T is a constant along an isotherm. And you're really just integrating one over V dV. That's the natural log. Upper and lower limits, you get this expression. I'm assuming this will be on your note card. And remember, if you're talking about the work done by the gas, it's always final volume divided by initial volume. So for the isotherm on top, we go from state one to state two, hence final volume is V2. On the bottom, we go from state three to state four. So the final volume is four. That's why four is in the numerator inside the natural log. Okay, so we've got our two expressions for the heats. Let's just plug those into the expression for efficiency. And I also wanna point out, uh, when you look at the PV diagram here, volume two, that's farther to the right on the V axis than is V1. So we're, we're looking at the natural log of a ratio that's greater than one. This number inside the log function is greater than one. And when you take the natural log of a number greater than one, you get a positive number. That's how I know that this heat is positive. Heat is being taken up by the gas along this isotherm. On the other hand, for the bottom isotherm, the final volume, V4, is actually less than the initial volume, V3. So this quantity is a, is a fraction less than one. When you take the natural log of a number between zero and one, I mean, it's still a positive ratio that we're looking at, but the natural log of a number between zero and one is negative. So this heat is a, a negative quantity. That makes sense because as the gas is being compressed in order to, to maintain its temperature, you, it would have to shed heat. So since we're interested in absolute values, remember QH and QC are absolute values. We, um, let's decide which of these is QH. Well, remember this isotherm corresponds to a higher temperature than this isotherm. So when we're taking up heat along this isotherm, we're doing so from the hot reservoir. So this is QH. QH is a positive number and it's equal to this number. Now, down here, this is the heat that's leaving along the low temperature isotherm. So it's being shed to the low temperature reservoir. That's QC, but we need QC to be a positive quantity. So since Q43 is a negative number, let's take the negative of that. And here's that result, QH is Q12, but for QC, we take the negative of Q43. Now you remember that rule for logs. Um, this is really a constant out front. It's a constant of negative one. And you can take that constant and turn it into an exponent inside the function. So what do I get if I raise this quantity, V4 over V3, V4 over V3, if I raise that quantity to the negative one power, that means take the reciprocal. So we can rewrite QC like that. Okay, so now that we've got our expressions for the Qs, we plug them into the formula for efficiency. Remember that's one minus QC over QH, and check it out, the NRs cancel. 
And wouldn't it be nice if this other garbage canceled? Because then we would have an expression that only involves the temperature. That would be awesome to have such a simple expression for the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine. So let's show that directly. I'll remind you that along these adiabatic processes, we can relate the initial and final temperatures and volumes. This is the TV to the gamma minus one relation. Let's look at this leftmost adiabatic compression. So we start at four, end at one. I'm just implementing the formula there. Over here, we start at three and end at two. Same formula. And now let's recognize uh, T4, the temperature at state four. We're on the bottom isotherm there. That's the cold temperature. So instead of T4 right here, I can just call that TC. Temperature one is up here along the high temperature isotherm. So I'll call that temperature TH. And I kind of did two things at once. The same thing down here, T3, that's on the bottom isotherm. So this temperature is actually TH. T2 is also, oh, I got that backwards. T3 is TC, it's the cold temperature. T2 is up here on the high temperature isotherm. So make those substitutions. And now we've got two equations involving TC and TH. And let's do something clever. Let's divide one equation by the other. So that's a valid algebraic technique. If you've got two equations, you can divide the left sides, divide the right sides, and then set those two sides equal to each other. So here's my little division bar. And you see how the TCs cancel, the THs cancel. And we're left with this expression. We can just enclose both sides in parentheses before exponentiating. And then, of course, if, uh, you know, if something to the gamma one, minus one is equal to something else to the gamma minus one, that means that your something is equal to your something else. Or you could raise both sides to the one over gamma minus one. Either way, this is the conclusion. And lastly, let's, let's reciprocate both sides of this equation, or take the reciprocal. And that's what we needed. This ratio, V3 to V4, is the same as V2 to V1. So we're taking the natural log of the same quantity on top and bottom. That means we can cancel the logs. Bye-bye logs. And there it is. That's the expression you saw in your book. I believe Carnot is the one who first arrived at this result. Of course, these have to be absolute temperatures. It doesn't work with Celsius. And I'll call that N Carnot. It's really the efficiency. It turns out to be the efficiency of any reversible engine. And I forget how to prove that, that any reversible engine has the same efficiency as a Carnot engine that may be in your chapter. So we've been talking about engines. Along the top isotherm is where heat is absorbed from the hot reservoir. That's going around clockwise. But you could also, remember, this, this whole cycle is reversible. That's the point. The, the adiabats or the adiabatic processes are reversible if you, if you did them slowly enough. You, know, you compress very slowly, no transfer of heat. You could then do an expansion uh, oppositely, which is retrace your steps. So let's reverse this entire cycle. And now we're going to be shedding heat QH to the hot reservoir and absorbing heat QC from the cold reservoir. If the temperatures haven't changed. It's the direction of heat transfer that has changed. And when I say the temperatures haven't changed, I'm talking about the temperature of the reservoirs. Now we're going around counterclockwise. This is a refrigerator. So this reversible cycle could be used or could be implemented for a heat engine or a refrigerator slash heat pump. So I will remind you what a refrigerator does. It, um, it doesn't happen spontaneously. Uh, an input of work is required to induce, I'll say, to induce a heat QC to flow, um, not in violation of the second law of thermodynamics, but to flow into the hot reservoir. So it would be a violation if it happened spontaneously, but we're putting work in, not spontaneous. Okay, so suppose you took this reversible cycle and you had two copies of it, and you, went, you ran one of them clockwise as a, an engine, and you ran the other counterclockwise as a refrigerator. So again, same quantity of gas, everything's the same. It's same number of moles, same temperatures, all that. You're just doing everything in reverse. So the, the output work from your Carnot engine could be used as the input work for your Carnot refrigerator. And look carefully at the net result of that process. Because the, um, because the QHs are the same either way, whether it's a heat engine or a refrigerator, 
the QHs are the same and the QCs are the same, and that means the Ws are the same, then the heat dumped to the cold reservoir by the uh, Carnot engine is equal in magnitude to the heat absorbed from the cold reservoir by the Carnot refrigerator. And you can see that by the thicknesses of the bars here. So anything withdrawn from the hot reservoir is put right back. Anything dumped into the cold reservoir is taken right back out. And that means the net effect here is zero. So if, if you have a Carnot engine running an identical Carnot refrigerator between the same two reservoirs, there's no violation of any law of thermodynamics there. There's no energy being created or destroyed, and there's no net movement of heat from cold to hot. So there's no violation of the second law of thermodynamics, which, which has that nice statistical interpretation. Okay, so here's the, here's the part that I find a little bit conceptually challenging. The following argument is so simple. It, it's so kind of shocking in its simplicity, and yet the result is powerful, that every time I've gone a few months without having read it, because I don't do 3C every semester, um, I, I almost feel like, wait, there's got to be something missing here. It, it seems incomplete. Uh, I, I end up being tempted to invent some, some alternative type of uh, cycle as a workaround. It just seems too simple, but I can't find any logical flaw in it. So here it is. Um, first, let's review efficiency as output work over QH. And you could solve that for QH. I don't actually think we're going to need that in the next slide. But the idea is, um, it's a proof by contradiction. Suppose that there were an engine out there that's more efficient than the Carnot engine or than a reversible cycle. Let's just suppose that you could construct a heat engine that would put out more work for the same heat intake than a Carnot engine would. Or if we want to use this diagram, an engine that could put out the same work as our Carnot engine, but requiring less heat input. That's the way I'm going to put it for this diagram here. Uh, a heat engine that's even more efficient than the Carnot engine is one that could do the same amount of work as a Carnot engine, and yet you would, you would not need to burn as much coal or whatever in order to uh, produce that output work. And here's what you would wind up with. Uh, if you just look at the, the thickness of the bars here, and I'll, I'll try to show this with the simple math here, but do you notice how this QH is not as thick as this QH, indicating that this hypothetical engine here is able to do the same output work as a Carnot engine? Remember, if this is really a reversible Carnot engine, then the input work for the refrigerator version is equal in magnitude to the output work for the Carnot or for the engine version. So it's able to do the same output work as a Carnot engine, and yet it does not require as much input heat. So I'm going to call this Q prime. And they're telling us, or QH prime. They're telling us that QH prime is less than, you know, this hypothetical engine has a QH prime less than the QH required for a Carnot heat engine. Now, if you just think about how QC works, remember QC is what's left over from QH after the output work. So I'll call this QC prime, and let's take a look here. By assumption, QH prime, the heat absorbed by this hypothetical super efficient engine, is less than QH. We don't need to burn as much coal to do the same output work as the Carn Carnot engine, hypothetically. Um, but remember, Q, Q prime C, you just take the heat absorbed by your engine and subtract the output work. Whatever's left over is exhausted as heat. That's just energy conservation. But I just established that the output work, by assumption, is the same as the output work of a Carnot engine, which is the same as the input, input work for this reversed cycle refrigerator. Um, but because QH prime, by assumption, because the heat absorbed by this super efficient engine does not need to be as great as the heat absorbed by the Carnot engine, then this quantity is less than QH minus work input. But what is QH minus work input? Uh, you look at the heat being dumped into the hot reservoir by the refrigerator, you subtract the input work. This is the heat taken up by the Carnot refrigerator. So now you can skip all the steps in the middle. And if you didn't follow that, you know, try rewinding and listen 
listening to it again or just stare at the diagram and think about it for yourself. But what I've just shown is that QC prime, the heat exhausted by this hypothetical engine, would have to be less than the heat taken up by the Carnot refrigerator if it really is more efficient than the Carnot engine. So the way I'm, just, I'm explaining it here is a little different from the way your book presents it, but it's equivalent. So look at the picture here. What's the net effect? If, if you are dumping, let's say, uh, 10 joules into the cold reservoir with your super efficient engine, but then you're taking away 15, see how this, this bar is thicker than this bar? If you're dumping in 10 and taking away 15, then overall what you've done is scooped heat out of the cold reservoir and dumped it into the hot reservoir. And so if you enclose this in your mind with one big box here, just think of these two together as a single object. I like the way your book puts it. Say you've got your heat engine and your Carnot refrigerator in the same room. Just put a giant box around them so it, you can think about it as one thing. The effect of this one thing is to take heat from the cold reservoir and dump it into the hot reservoir without any input work, right? This is already a, you've already accounted for the output work. Sure, the, um, the super efficient engine on its own is putting out work and sure the refrigerator on its own requires input work, but they're getting that from each other. So just put the box around the whole thing and now there's no output work. So the net effect would be this, and of course, we know that that's not possible. That would be a violation of the second law, the, the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics. You're not going to get heat flowing from cold to hot, not through any finite temperature difference. So proof by contradiction. We've just shown it. If, if there were a heat engine out there that could do the same amount of work operating between the same two temperature reservoirs, if it could do the same amount of work as a Carnot engine for less input heat, then the immediate conclusion is that you could make an engine that violates the second law. And since nobody's ever done that, and it sure doesn't appear to be possible, that must mean that it's not possible to make an engine that's more efficient than the Carnot engine. That's it. I mean, it's such a simple argument. Maybe not the first time you hear it, but um, again, I, I, at first I think, wait a minute. Okay, what if, forget about the reversibility. Can't you just make a refrigerator that may not be reversible. Maybe it's not a reversible refrigerator, but it's more efficient than some particular Carnot heat engine, which is reversible. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're having the same issue. Every time I try to, I, I think I've realized that there's some workaround. Of course, there's not a workaround. In, it's kind of an impenetrable argument and very profound because really the whole chapter depended on it, right? If you think about it, well, the whole chapter depends on this result. But now we know that, that there's, there's no point in looking for a heat engine that's more efficient than that. Now, we're, keep in mind, we're talking about thermal engines, engines that produce output work due to, due to a temperature difference between uh, two bodies of fluid or whatever. So there are other types of engines out there, like there's electric motors, and that's, that's different physics. Um, electric motors can be super efficient. They can be nearly 100 efficient. So whatever um, electricity is being drawn from the power company, you know, over 99% of that conceivably could actually go as output work because those don't operate the same way. That's not about um, thermal transfers. You're talking about electric charges and the fundamental interactions between them. So just keep in mind that this efficiency is for a heat engine. And I'll leave you with this, this funny cartoon from XK CD. That guy obviously has a pretty broad base of science knowledge, but he's, he's slightly redefined the various processes here.